Hello, this is and I am Kitty Hollywood. The review today is Paramount's 1946 The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. Starring Barbara Stanwyck, Kirk Douglas, Van Heflin, Elizabeth Scott, Judith Anderson. That'll do for now. Um, it was directed by Lewis Milestone, produced by Hal Wallace, uh, costumes by Edith Head, uh, composed by Miklos Rosa, the music. Um, and it's a juicy film. To what? Sam, make Keep em. talking. I'm all of them rolled into one. Yes. You're a gymnasium instructor in Philadelphia with a muscle for a brain and a tendency to insipid verse. You're a guy, just a guy named Pete in Erie, who smells of fish and sings. You're last year's greatest fullback, and you flunked your bar exam, but you wanted to be an industrial engineer. You're a guy who came along to fix a tire so well, you became a city-paid inspector. And you're a lot of this. But worst of all, you're the one and only man who shares with me the only claim I have on it. The film was written by Robert Rosson. It was adapted by a short story by Jack Patrick called Love Lies Bleeding. It's about three teenagers who come together and experience a traumatic incident. A lot of time goes by. The three teenagers are now grown-ups. Two of them are married to each other, Barbara Stanwyck, Kirk Douglas. And then Van Heflin, stranger, comes into town and everything blows up, not literally. For years, I did not get why it was called The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. I hadn't seen the film. I was thinking, what is this film about? Is what, does she love turtles? What's going on? Or is it just that she loves peculiarly? I've seen it now. I have a much better understanding. This film stars Barbara Stanwyck, who was 39 when she made it. She was born Ruby Catherine Stevens and she was orphaned at the age of four. And she was determined from a very, very young age to become a star. In 1944, she was the highest paid woman in the USA. She's famous for Stella Dallas, Sorry Wrong Number, Double Indemnity. Barbara Stanwyck's husband in this film is played by Kirk Douglas. This was his first film role. Born Isura Danielovich, uh, Kirk Douglas was uh, one of, uh, I think, roughly seven or so, but they're all sisters apart from him, so um, his family were incredibly poor. They were Jewish, moved to New York, and he, he said that effectively lit a fire underneath him, and he was utterly determined again to get out there to become an actor, to become well known. And eventually he ended up at the same um, acting college as Betty Joan Persky, otherwise known as Lauren Bacall, and she persuaded um, somebody to come and take a look at him, and really the rest is history. In this film, he plays a really weak-willed character. He's a drunkard, he's unloved, and it's very much at odds to the concept of the Kirk Douglas that we know um, as a result of all of his later films. Barbara Stanwyck's troubled teenage love is played by Van Heflin as a grown man. Um, he was 36 when he made this film. He was very interested in becoming an actor, didn't have much success, got a job on a tramp steamer, went to sea, made, some, made a film, went to sea, did a play, until finally Catherine Hepburn saw him and persuaded her producers to put him in a film. He's best known for uh, Johnny Eager with Robert Taylor and Lana Turner. He won a Best Supporting Oscar for that film. I cried my eyes out when I saw that film. Um, the 310 to Yuma, starring Glenn Ford alongside him. Uh, Shane, of course, come back, Shane! Um, and he is... It's surprising watching him in this film because he is so young and you're used to seeing him as maybe, uh, say, a late 40s, 50-year-old actor. So he is really quite compelling and he's also got a very pleasant blandness that works to offset the complex nature of his character. And fourthly, this film stars Elizabeth Scott. She was Elizabeth Scott, but she took the E away to be interesting. She was 24 years old when she made this film. This was her second feature film role. She 
again, interest, it's funny, uh, she was a very, very determined youngster who wanted to be an actor, so there you go, um, well, at least three out of four of them. She uh, put in the hard yards, went to Broadway, slogged it out. Uh, Elizabeth Scott was eventually, after a couple of sort of tries at Hollywood and fruitless meetings, signed by producer um, Hal Wallace, who popped her in this film, and she became known slightly unfortunately for her as sort of a poor man's Lauren Bacall. I think she's, I think this is unfair, I think she had enough going on in her own right but you know you get one husky voiced sultry blonde and what do you do? You have to repeat it. Um, she became famous for s films like Dead Reckoning, um, Too Late for Tears, this is one of her more famous roles. Right, films directed by Lewis Milestone, um, born 1895 in Moldova. Uh, Lewis Milestone is most fa um, famous for directing All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, Of Mice and Men, and then much, much later on, The Rat Pack, Ocean's Eleven. The costumes for this film are by Edith Head. I could talk about Edith Head forever, so I'm not going to. Edith Head and Barbara Stanwyck had a very, very strong filmic working relationship. Some have suggested they also had a lesbonic relationship, but I don't know for sure, so that's as far as that's going to go. Um, they first worked together, I think, in the film Remember the Night. Um, Barbara Stanwyck felt that she didn't do glamour well and that Edith Head was the woman who was able to transform her into being a glamorous chick, so much so that she asked Edith Head to design a lot of her own personal wardrobe. She looks absolutely gorgeous in this film. Um, there is one beautiful moment in the film when she actually says, oh, well, I'm going to, going to go and change into something else because I wouldn't want him to see me in the same outfit. And it's almost effectively an excuse for another gown. And really, who cares? I'm happy to watch another gown. It's a very convoluted film. It is less convoluted than The Maltese Falcon, but more convoluted than pretty much everything else. Um, is it a film noir? Is it a melodrama? There's arguments both ways. Um, a, so, quite a bit of it takes place at night time. In fact, I'm amazed at how late um, mechanical garages are open because he seems to arrive there about 11 o'clock at night. Anyhow, um, the relationship between Van Heflin and Elizabeth Scott, Sam Masterson and Tony Marachek is a lovely one to watch because it's very natural and you just watch them unfold and get to know each other and there's very, very little that is, very, very little of it is mannered. That pine soap makes you tingle all over. There's something very personal about soap. It's almost as personal as a toothbrush. I won't use your toothbrush. Where's your book now? You don't care what kind of a book it is? The suspense is killing me. It isn't my book. Somebody here before forgot and left it. I warned you. <laughs> it actually works as a nice foil to the Martha Ivers, Walter O'Neill, because they're there going, for the entire film having you know these arguments and I love you I hate you and they're just there having a quiet chat on a bed about the Gideon's Bible together um, there's plenty of biffo and guns um, the scene at the end of the film involving a gun uh, was apparently something that was improvised by Barbara Stanwyck so check that out um, but all in all, I think it's a film that its strengths are in the performances, so don't worry that the plot's a bit strange and ludicrous. Um, in, sit back and enjoy the fact that somebody says, hit me Sam, I've got it coming, and just, just sink yourself into it, because there's no point, I don't think, looking at it from a, oh, but that's, that wouldn't happen and that's strange there, because it does happen and it's all a bit strange and... You know, there's a circus train involved in this film. So leap into it. It's a crazy wild ride, but immensely enjoyable for all of that. I would give it 8 out of 10. The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. Mm -hmm.